So, uh, I'm Mitch Monroe. I guess we'll just kind of get started. I mean, this is your opportunity here to ask me any questions that you guys want to know. I can sit here and I can go into my normal same spiel about stuff, but you can watch that stuff on YouTube. You've seen it a hundred times on videos. So what do you guys want to know? I mean, here's your opportunity to ask me any questions about anything, life on the tour, certain techniques, rod, reel, line, lures, you name it. This is pretty much an open forum. There are no dumb questions. So let's go ahead and get started. Who's got the first question? Okay, the question is about flipping. When I'm flipping regular cover, do I use braid, do I use floral, do I use leaders? The answer to the leader side is never using a leader when you're flipping because when you tie that knot in there, that's going to always be the weakest point and when you're flipping, you're setting the hook hard. Secondly, when I'm open water, regular cover flipping, I always use fluorocarbon. 25 pound test, maxima fluorocarbon. Um, there's actually a pretty cool video that's got me swinging an eight over a dock with 25 pound test fluorocarbon. Uh, braid is used for when I'm punching mats or flipping lily pads or some type of vegetation that I need to rip through. So that's the only time I do it, but never ever tie a leader. The only time I tie leaders from braid to fluorocarbon is if I'm using it on spinning gear, fishing really deep or making really, really long casts. And I just need to get a better hookup ratio and that braid has no stretch so you get a better hookup ratio with fluorocarbon. The question is, is do I, would I use fluorocarbon for the lack of visibility? And the answer is yes. It's pretty much when you're flipping regular cover, they can't see that braid. I can say that I like the feel of fluorocarbon in regular, but I like the feel of braid in matted vegetation just because you can feel the bait better and get a better hookup ratio. Uh, question is, my first boat that I ever had when I started fishing seriously was a Ranger 354V. I actually saved up my whole uh, summer working at Burger King, picking up cans, mowing lawns, walking dogs, babysitting. You name it, I did it to make money. My dad actually told me, whatever I come up with, he'll give me the other half. So I'm sitting here and I got five grand. I'm excited. I'm looking for all these boats. Well, this lady, um, her husband passed away and she, she wanted to sell the boat. She just wanted to get rid of it. So she's like $12,000 for this. Well, I got five. My dad said he'll double it. So now I got to go negotiate with Pops, which is a very interesting thing. If you don't know my dad, my dad is the Grinch and Scrooge mixed all into one. So getting him to step up a little bit more, but it was a promise of a lot of car washes. It was a promise of good grades. It was, it was a lot of stuff, but I got him to step up. Then I had to find a vehicle. So I had no money left that I had to get a vehicle. So I got a boat, but I ain't got no way to tow it. So one of the buddies of his was selling a van that was in actually excellent condition for $1,100. And I came up with five and he forked out the rest for me. And I had a van, so I had a van and a 354 Ranger that was a year old. And boy, I tore up the tournament circuit with it. Okay, question is, is what kind of equipment that I use for skipping jigs and how do I set my reel? Uh, the rod that I use, it's called a Stee 7 foot 1 inch medium heavy action AGS rod. Um, it's basically an extra fast rod, but it's got a little bit of tip and a lot of backbone. That little bit of tip allows you to get that angle going so it skips real well. The reel that I use is a Daiwa Stee's SV reel. And the unique part about this reel, it's a new reel coming out by Daiwa. With, it's called an SV spool. Eliminates backlashes completely. And so now what you can do is you have your uh, mag force on the side and you have your regular knob right there by the handle. Well, when you take it, you have it completely, it's turned off. The whole reel is completely at zero. And you move the spool. Well, the spool wobbles. Well, you start tightening it up that one side next to the handle until the spool doesn't really wobble at all and then from there you can use the mag force to actually set it for casting as far as you want or short as you want from there and you'll never get a backlash out of it and so usually skipping is 15 pound tests uh, maximum fluorocarbon line I try to stick with a 3 8 or quarter ounce jig for skipping it skips a lot easier that way the coldest water temperature I've ever had success um, I want to say 46 degrees 
uh, Bassmaster Classic at Grand Lake, 46 degrees, and catch them on a jerk bait. Anytime that water gets below 50 degrees, jerk bait. But when I say you gotta fish it slow, you gotta fish it slow. And I mean, you throw it out there, and you're hoping you got a suspending one or a sinking one, and you go jerk, jerk, pick up a cup of coffee, take a couple sips, make a phone call to your wife or your girlfriend, talk to her for a little while, call your buddy, ask him how he's doing, jerk it, start all over, drink a cup of coffee again, look at your graph, try to find the next place you're gonna go fish, make another phone call, jerk, and I'm talking literally three minute, three to five minute casts. A single cast will take three to five minutes, and I mean, once I get it out there, it's that first two initial jerks, and it's almost like you can sit there and count to 20 or 30 before you make the, the next jerk on it. It'd be like jerk, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, all the way up to 20, jerk it again, just start counting, and all of a sudden the line will either go tick or it just moves off. And, and that's the coldest that, but anytime I get anything colder than that, I really don't like to throw jigs or worms at that time because a jerk bait is really, really effective in that super cold, cold water. The question is, is when I go to a lake for the circuit, do I always try to find a place that's familiar to me, the, the style of fishing that I like to do? Yes, that's exactly what I'm looking for. I'm always going to a place, I love to flip, I love to frog, and I know that technique, I feel better than anybody on tour. If that bite's going on, usually I'm in the mix for having an opportunity to win, so that's what I'm looking for. But that doesn't always happen. I go to a lake, water's down, so there's no flipping. There might not be an access to frog bite on that lake, so then I'm gonna have to make adjustments. And the first adjustment I make is a spinner rake from there. So if I can't find the technique the way I want to fish, next thing I'm going with is a spinnerbait. Spinnerbait's going to allow me to fish anywhere from 6 inches of the water to 60 feet of water comfortably and it will catch fish. And it allows me to move around and cover a lot of water very effectively. I can fish a spinnerbait fast or I can actually slow roll it and crawl it on the bottom super slow and bass will still eat it. So if I can't find my strengths, which is what I'm always looking for, then I'm going straight to a spinnerbait after that. Spinnerbait is the most versatile bait. I mean, you can take it, you can burn it on top, they'll eat it on top as you're burning it. You can wind it in the middle like you normally would just winding a spinnerbait. You can wind it, stop, wind it, go. You can take it and you can throw it out there. You can fish it on the bottom like a jig if you want to. Fish will still eat a spinnerbait. So that's why it's always kind of my go-to. That's the, probably the one rod that stays tied up in a boat anywhere I go in the country. No. Oh. What type of line do you use for your square bills? Type of line I use for my square bills. Well, I'm using fi uh, fluorocarbon, but I'm using it on a fiberglass or a composite rod. Because if you use mono and a fiberglass or composite rod, you've got way too much stretch. I never throw a braid because braid uh, instantly, as soon as you try to run that uh, square bill over a log or hit it off a dock, it's gonna bury itself right in there because there's no stretch, no movement on it. So fluorocarbon has less stretch in it, but just a little bit, and that fiberglass rod takes up the shock absorption of the fish biting and the fish jumping, and you don't lose them that way. So fluorocarbon, 12 to 15 pound on my square bills. Sometimes I wanna go up to 20 if I wanna fish it shallower. I'll go down to 10 or even eight when I wanna fish it a little bit deeper. question is, is when the elites were here, did I stay on St. Clair and I run the Lake Erie? Well, what I was doing is I did something that I don't normally do in tournaments and it, I feel like it actually cost me uh, making the classic is I fish conservatively. One thing about St. Clair is I stayed on St. Clair. There's 800 million largemouth. I literally went out and caught 50 a day. I mean, I'd pull up and literally sit on a spot and I'd catch a limit in 10 minutes on a spot. So I was figuring what I'd do is I'd go out and catch 15 pounds a day and I need one four to five pound bite that gets me 16 to 16 and a half pounds a day and you cash a check. I ended up missing a check by less than a pound and I literally caught 50 a day fishing for largemouth. So I stayed on St. Clair and it cost me making the classic. That's the same thing you did the year, two years ago before? Two years ago I fished the open and I actually ended up a check at uh, 38th. Um, but there's a difference between fishing open guys and elite series guys. Elite series guys are so dialed. Opens guys were. What was it the year before that the elites were there again? The year before the elites were there, I fished all uh, smallmouth. 
and just they moved on me you know the first day I had 18 pounds and it was weird because that year that the elites were there on St. Clair the smallmouth were skinny for some reason it's like the gobies disappeared and it was just that one fluke year I had 18 pounds still and it seems like I would have had 20 if, I would, if they were normal so then the next day I go out and I weighed 12 and I should have weighed 15 and it just still once again put me right on the bubble for missing the cut and so I said Play a conservative, go catch largemouth, that's what you like to do, and have fun. I mean, literally 50-50 largemouth a day, nobody else fished for them. Hackney did one day, and he caught them good. Uh, Bill Lowen caught them good, but they had one little canal somewhere on the Erie that had some big fish in it. Me, I just was surrounded by two and a half to three and a half pound fish, and just never caught enough of those three and a half pound fish to get me where I needed to be. Uh, when I'm fishing deep, when I'm looking for my graph, fish and structure. You know, when you're fishing deep, you can see the fish on your Lorentz graph, and then you're looking for the type of structure. You know, um, you're looking for hard bottoms in places that don't normally have them, shell beds, things like that. Um, if there's some muck around and you see a shell bed, then fish are going to be loaded on that shell bed. I mean, you could take your jig, throw it out there. As soon as you start feeling that shell, most likely you're going to get bit. No. The different techniques for smallmouth and largemouth on St. Clair is um, smallmouth out there, you're drop shotting. And the thing I hate about St. Clair is all you do is you drive your boat and you just start fishing. And it's so random because of the bowl. There's no depressions, there's no drops, there's no nothing. And the fish are just roaming around that thing. And if you run into them, you're loading them up. But the next day you could go back there and they're gone. Largemouth, all you do is you run up, you got the river that's obviously splits the lake you go to the canadian and the indian reservation and there is more grass up there and more reeds and there's docks and i mean you'll see the largemouth literally swimming around your boat and all you do is just flip for them and throw a frog for them and you can catch as many as you want no. but you just want to go fun fishing and you just want to go catch largemouth that's the place that i would go to i mean nobody's fishing for them people are like looking at me all weird they're like what are you doing around here i'm like catching bass i'm like oh there's another one there's another one they're like there's bass around here i'm like yeah they're loaded in here all the canals and stuff that are over there have hundreds and hundreds of bass in them Uh, the question is about electronics. What I find the, out of all the new innovations, electronics wasn't going to be the most useful technique. The new 3D structure scan by Lawrence, you're completely getting a 360 degree view of the actual structure you're fishing. So say you're on a lake and you're going to go up and you're going to fish a hump. Well, you go over the hump and you see the fish but you don't get to see how the fish are positioned. Now with 3D, you're gonna be able to scroll the screen around and look and see which side of the hump they're sitting on. So you've got a hump that comes up right here. And when you go over with 2D, you see the fish, you're not sure if they're on this side, this side, this side, or this side of the hump, but you see they're there. Now with 3D, you're gonna see the school of fish whichever side that they're sitting on. So if they're sitting on this side, you're gonna move your boat to this side to cast up and bring it off the shelf. If they're sitting on this side, you're gonna put, pull back on this side and be able to make that cast. And the 3D is gonna actually allow you to make more accurate casts, allow to tell you where the shell is and the rock is and how the fish are positioned. And so it's gonna be huge uh, for it, but it's only available on the Lawrence Gen 3 units and it has a, has a special transducer for it, but it's uh, available to everybody and it's amazing. No. You replace it. You replace your 2D structure scan with this one. Yeah, um, it's a little bit bigger, but they do have a flush mount for it. If you're running a Ranger, it's going to fit on that same back pad as your three, your standard 2D structure scan on it. It's amazing. Next. Biggest limit I've ever caught? Tournament fishing or actual just fun fishing? The biggest limit I ever caught in tournament fishing was... Uh, 35 pounds, 12 ounces. That was at Lake Okeechobee uh, in 2012. I also had a 35 pound bag at Amistad. I caught a 32 pound bag at Clear Lake. Biggest limit I ever caught is 41 pounds at Clear Lake and caught most of them on a buzz bait. It's probably one of the funnest days I've ever had. It's just amazing. It's just like every place I pull up, I try to throw a buzz bait. Big one eats it. 
Uh, biggest fish I've ever caught is 14 pounds, one ounce out of the California Delta. Biggest fish I had an opportunity to at was at Lake Amistad. The same uh, first day of practice, there was one between 16 and 18 pounds on a bed. I left it because I was hoping it'd be their tournament day. When I pulled back up, it was a 12 incher sitting on the bed. And then during the actual event itself, I hooked her twice. She was between 14 and 16 pounds. When I initially saw, I didn't even know it was a fish. I pulled in, the male's probably six or seven pounds. So I flipped at the male next to this log and what I thought was a log decided to roll on its side and show me that it's a bass. And I'm just, eyes get all big. And I flip down there and she eats it, comes off. Next time I flip back up there, she eats it again. Don't get a hook in her. And she just swims away real slow, hurt, hurt bad. just crushing just so. Was that the year you were catching them on a giant tube? Yep, the year I was catching them on a seven inch uh, tube made by Mismo now before it was made by a company called Gets It. Uh, it's just, it, it's kind of like with bed fishing. Any fish over five pounds that I've ever found on a bed, I will say I can catch nine out of ten times with that bait. Reason is, it's just like you. You're watching your kids at the playground and some other kid comes by, you're not really going to worry about it, but a big old scruffy looking dude starts getting in there with your kids, you're going to go over there and you're going to do something about it. And that's how the bass see when they're throwing a big bait like that. Most people for years have thought you got to throw these little small baits to get the fish to pick it up and move it off the bed. Now they just ignore it. They don't even worry about it anymore. And, but you can take that big tube and you flip it on that bed with that big fish, she's going over there to pounce it. And it don't take long. Oh. Okay, question is what uh, rod reel line I use for a drop shot. Um, I use what's called a Steez AGS, same rod for drop shot fishing. It's a rod that when you pick it up, it changes your life. The reel I use is the Steez reel or the Exist by Daiwa. That's also a reel that changes your life. They actually you got to take a mortgage, second mortgage out to buy one. You got to your bank account too. But it's one of those concepts that I tell people when it comes to fishing tackle, you get what you pay for. You want the most sensitivity, you buy this rod and reel combo. And literally you can crawl your drop shot over a dime in 50 feet of water and it'll tell you the date on it. That's how sensitive it is. Uh, line is uh, Maxima fluorocarbon, um, but if I'm fishing it deep, I'm actually gonna, what I call, top shotting it, running braid, 15 to 20 pound Maxima braid to a fluorocarbon leader anywhere from 10 to 20 feet. I always wanna make sure when I'm fishing that leader from braid to fluorocarbon, when I get close to the boat and I'm fighting that fish, I wanna make sure that knot is in the reel because you don't want to be fighting that fish with that knot back and forth running through those guides because it will eventually break on you and you don't want that. So reel is the uh, 2508 Steez reel, the seven foot, um, seven foot even medium light action um, or they have a medium light uh, single, uh, what do they call it? The uh, uh, solid tip. And that's for nose hooking. It's this special tip that it just bends real good. And you can actually watch it when they're biting it. They don't feel it, but it's super sensitive. And it just starts bending over. And you just load the rod on it. And that's the rod I use for drop shot. So. The question is, do I use the same length leader all the time when I'm out there drop shotting? No. It just depends on how I feel that day. If I feel like I'm gonna retie a lot, my leader's gonna be a lot longer. If I don't feel like I'm gonna retie that much, it's gonna be a lot shorter. Like I said, somewhere between 10 feet and 20 feet. That much, yeah. Because what it is, is once you make that cast out there, that braid's out there, you're gonna feel that sensitivity through that braid and get that hook set, and that's pretty much what you need. But you don't wanna have them fish seeing that line. So if you're 10, 15, 20 feet away from them on from braid, it's not gonna spook them at all. But I also feel like braid gives off a lot more vibration too when you're moving it, and I feel like they feel that, and it spooks them sometimes. Vibration is a huge key to fish. Like if you're out there, and you've got music playing, it's a constant beat, I don't think it bothers them. But if you go up and you drop something, all of a sudden it spooks them because it's like, I do that, you see people's heads turn, fish get the same exact way. But then the opposite side of that is they've proven it where guys have gone down scuba diving and they start banging rocks together and the fish start swimming over to the scuba divers. And then that's when I start breaking out a one ounce, a one and a half ounce weight flipping in a lot of situations that people won't do it and it seems to catch a lot of fish.
Uh, the type of knot, type of knot that I tie from the braid to the fluorocarbon is called an Albright knot. A lot of guys use the Alberto or the Uni to Uni knot. Um, to me, the Albright knot is about the simplest one for me to tie, and I feel like one of the strongest. It's good enough for Aaron Martins. It's good enough for me. Question is, is when I would use a jig or a rattle on a jig, when do I do and when do I don't? I'm always using a rattle on a jig that I use. Um, I always feel like the more noise you make with a jig, like when a crawdad's crawling around down there, he's not being stealthy. He's moving around, he's trying to make noise, and you're gonna attract fish with that noise. I always try to fish a jig with a rattle on it. I mean, if I gotta put one on there, or I'm making one with it, or I'm buying one that already has it on it, I'm always using rattles on my jig. I mean, Denny Brower has proven it for years, the rattle, triple rattle back jig, which is the loudest jig out there, he's caught a million fish on it and made a whole lot of money, so I've always kind of taken that concept of having the loudest rattle. Same thing with my square bills. I have a silent square bill and a square bill with a rattle in it. 80% of the time I fish that one with a rattle in it. The only time I fish the one without is when everybody else around me is throwing a square bill with a rattle in it, just trying to be a little bit different. Uh, do I, when I take my crankbaits out of package, do I change the hooks out on them? On my personal square bills, no. Um, we created this hook in Japan or in China that, I mean, it's amazing. It's got the perfect round bend to it. And so I'll take the hooks off that crankbait to put on other crankbaits that I might use. You know, if I'm throwing a DD-22, I pull those off. If it's not a Gamagatsu hook or something on that level that's coming on it, most likely I'm changing it out. Do I have a favorite lake? I always get asked that question. It, other than where I live, if, I, if you took California out of it, which is really hard to do because where I live, I've got Don Pedro, McClure, Maloney's, Comanche. Those are within 45 minutes of my house. The California Delta is 30 minutes from my house. Clear Lake is an hour and a half from my house. So you have Clear Lake. Clear Lake, 12 months out of the year, takes 25 pounds every single tournament to win. If you don't have 25 pounds a day, you might as well just go home because you're not doing it. So then the Delta, 12 months out of the year, while you guys are snowing and icing and stuff like that, 20 pounds a day to catch, you know, to do good in tournaments there. So then you got Comanche. Comanche has the uh, world record smallmouth, largemouth, and spot swimming me in it. Um, Maloney's has five or six record spots that live in it. They got one that they personally walk down to the dock and they hand feed this thing. It's gotta be 12 or 14 pounds. The spots, it's like that long and about that wide, but it, there's a sign, federal sign, no fishing at this dock because it's a marina dock and the sheriff's boat sits right there and his base is right there. So, they, but they hand feed this fish. So, Maloney's, World record largemouth, world record spotted bass in it. So these are places that I have. So when you say the favorite place to fish, why would I want to go anywhere else? Oh, I, I tell people all the time, you want an opportunity at catching a 10 pound bass. They talk about Florida, Florida is overrated. You look at Lake Okeechobee, guys go down there. The guy won the ever start three days, 15 pounds a day on Lake Okeechobee in the springtime. That's like, to me, not really great fishing. Guy got a check with 10 pounds a day. You go to Texas, Texas is great in February, March, and April, but after that, the humidity down there, fishing in 90 degree heat and in 110% humidity, it's not even fun, and them fish get buried in that grass, you don't even catch them. Ah, then you go up north in the summertime, it's amazing fishing, but then you gotta deal with snow in the wintertime. So, it, it's really hard to say. I, Gunnersville is overpopulated. Um, God, Chickabobble is amazing. It's a good, it's a really good lake. It's probably the hottest lake right now, but it's getting a lot of pressure. But if I had to pick one outside, oh, it'd have to be Falcon down, down in Texas. But even then, it's, we fished it the first year we went down there, amazing. Like you could literally go down. I sat in a spot and watched this dark spot over here and a dark spot over here. Well, this dark spot over here, was about 500 bass in the ranges of four to six pounds. This dark spot over here was about a thousand tilapia that are that big. 
So I'm sitting in it. What it was is it was a flooded pond in the middle of these trees. And I found this thing just kind of weeding my way back through it. So I'd sit there and you wait. And you get this dark spot and this dark spot moving like this. Well, all of a sudden, one of the dark spots would actually turn and come back towards the other dark spot. And when they collided, it looked like Beirut. It was just their tilapia flying everywhere. And I literally sat in a spot for two hours and every single cast caught a five pounder. I was doubling up, I'm throwing a um, lunker punker. It's a topwater bait, it's this big. I'm throwing on a swim bait rod with 80 pound braid. I'm literally boat flipping doubles of five pounders in my boat, putting them on the balance beam and they're exactly the same. I had to leave this school of fish because they're all the same size and literally caught 25 pounds and still was sitting in 40th place in the tournament. Now we go and 20 pounds a day gets you a check and the weights aren't as big, but there's still guys catching giant sacks down there. So I'd have to say Falcon would be the lake of, of my choice. So. Ohio River is awesome. Um, no, Tappan, this lake called Tappan. It's near uh, Newcomer's Town. Yep, Fletcher took me out there, told me, dude, this place is awesome. We literally fished out there for eight hours and caught one bass. <laughs> one bass. And, I tell, and so every time we go somewhere, he goes, dude, this place is just like Tappan. And I'm just like, it's going to suck. It's going to suck really, really bad. Favorite presentation on gin clear water with vegetation. If the vegetation is matted, I'm flipping. If it's not matted, I'm throwing a top water. You can't be the top water fishing it all day long in clear water. Some of the biggest fish I've even ever caught have been on top water at between 11 and one o'clock. And for some reason, they get up there, it looks natural to them, they eat it. So clear water vegetation, if it's not matted to the top, I'm throwing a top water bait. If it's mad to the top, I'm punching in it. So. Do I fish a frog most of the time? Yes, I do. I mean, a frog, I fish it a lot. I mean, it's one of them baits that you're not going out there to go try to catch 30 or 40 fish, but if you're fishing a tournament, it's going to catch a better average than a guy throwing a spinnerbait or a crankbait or a worm. So. What do I do to my frogs to get a better hookup ratio? Um, the frog that I design, actually, you'll see it. The hooks sit on top of the frog versus the hook sitting on the side of a frog like you see it most of the time. I feel like with the frog, the hook sitting on top, it actually gets a better hookup ratio overall. If you're still not getting a good hookup ratio, take a pair of pliers and I'm saying bend them up. We're talking a 32nd of an inch just to raise it off that body because most of the time the hooks are hitting in the body. And so that's all I do. Don't trim the legs or anything like that. Don't wait on the hook set. As soon as I see that color gone, I'm setting the hook because most of the time when a fish blows up on a frog, he's already got the frog in the mouth by the time you've seen the splash. So you can just jack him. So you don't wait right away? I don't wait. I use contrasting colors. And uh, basically, so if I'm fishing a cheese mat that's green, I'm gonna throw a white frog, a black frog, a brown frog. You can throw a pink frog up there. It doesn't really matter because they can't tell the color, but it's just something contrasting. So then when you see that color gone, it's immediately set in the hook. I saw that early in my career. I was fishing a red man tournament on Clear Lake and I literally watched this fish come up from underneath the dock and it's literally sitting a foot underneath the water. And I'm like, it's not gonna eat, it's not gonna eat. All of a sudden it flares its gills and it's still sitting underneath the water and the frog goes into his throat. And I jack him and it's a six pounder. So it, it tells you that these fish are already opening to inhale their mouth and they've got it in their throat most of the time. So once they hit it, I think a lot of times guys actually miss the fish because he's blown up on it, he's taking it down, he's already blown it out. By the time you go to swing and you're just like, how did you miss him? I think he was already blowing it out. Because once again, he gets that thing in his mouth, he feels that it's not tasting like something normal. It's not being like something normal. It's like you, you take a bite of a piece of chicken or a steak that don't taste right, you're immediately spitting it out. What about your line? Do you let slack in your line or try to keep a little tension on it? I try to keep a little tension on it. You don't want to straight line them because then you don't get a hook set, but you want to just, I mean, a little bit of tension to feel them there and then you can set the hook.
So I'm usually working the frog right here, so he blows up on it, it's an immediate hook set like this. Not working it, oh, then giving it to him, or working it straight at him, working it to where he bites it and you're trying to get the pull away from him. That's what you do. So, and then having a frog rod that has a little bit of tip action to it, but still being an extra fast, a little bit of tip, extra heavy action rod when I'm flipping, or throwing a frog. So. There's no more questions. I appreciate you guys coming out. Everybody needs to go buy a brand new Ranger boat. Uh, buy all the Steve's equipment that you can and lots of my frogs. Appreciate you guys coming out.